Just turn back on the so there's a puppy right there that can talk about it.
No. We just got wildly unlucky. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah.
Test two, three, test two, three. Final audio check. Watch your P's and Q's. <laughs> Okay, sure. Okay. And you can just shove the slack in your pocket there. Sure. And also, I'm going to throw a little redundant Yeah. Are you okay? Are you a puncher? I don't think so. I think we should be good. about the right spot? Okay. On my waistband, okay. Kind of weird. I think, uh, I think we are. Mm. Did I, I had a struggle to get it on. Did I? Oh. Uh, there, there it was. I hear it. Yeah, I heard her. I heard her. I, I think so. 
trying to see if I can <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I'm sure, either way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to introduce a student for them. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Sorry for the delay. We had to get uh, a few more chairs so we could seat everyone. What a terrific audience um, and terrific audience given the lovely South Bend weather uh, as well. Um, I, I'm Philip Munoz. I'm the director of the center. Uh, just a few announcements before I uh, introduce um, our student who will introduce our speakers. Uh, we have three really phenomenal events coming up uh, and I want to invite you to them all. On Thursday, uh, April 13th at 4 p.m., uh, this is co-sponsored with uh, Mendoza, uh, a Mendoza lecture by uh, really a phenomenally interested, interesting entrepreneur, Maget Wade. She's going to speak about free markets and economic freedom in Africa, uh, and she is not not to be missed. Uh, and then two lectures uh, where we're the where we are the primary sponsor. These are in conjunction with uh, my Cortex class. Uh, Carl Truman. Uh, he wrote a book. Um, uh, inventing the Modern Self, um, which I think is one of the most important books written in the last 20 years. He'll be here to present that book. Uh, and then something I'm very, very uh, proud and pleased of, um, Harvey Mansfield, arguably the most distinguished living uh, political theorist today, will be giving what could be his uh, last uh, formal public lecture, a lecture on Tocqueville. Uh, Carl Truman will be here on uh, April 17th. 12:30 uh, in this room, lunch beforehand, and then Harvey Mansfield, uh, April 26, again at 12:30 in, in this room. So uh, uh, please note those dates and come back and join us then. Um, I'm going to introduce Elizabeth uh, Hale, who's going to introduce our speaker. Um, I just want to hold up the book. I've been reading this this week. It is a wonderful book, and Elizabeth will give them a proper introduction. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Benjamin Story and Jenna Silver Story are both senior fellows in the Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies Department at the American Enterprise Institute, where their research focuses on political philosophy, civil society, classical schools, and higher education. Jenna Silver Story was previously assistant professor in politics and international affairs at the, and the executive director of the Tocqueville Fellows Program at Furman University. She earned her PhD from the University of Chicago's Committee on Social Thought and a BA from Boston University. Benjamin Story was previously, previously served as Jane Gage Hip Professor of Politics and International Affairs and Director of the Tocqueville Fellows Program at Furman University. He was also previously a visiting fellow at the James Madison Program at Princeton University, as well as the Director of a National Endowment for the Humanities and During Questions Course Development Project. He earned his PhD from the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago and a BA from UNC Chapel Hill. The, talk, the topic of their lecture today is liberal education and the restless soul. Please join me in welcoming the stories. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much to um, Philip Munoz and uh, Rick Aframenko and Debbie O'Malley for inviting us here and doing such a splendid job in hosting us. We have been to Notre Dame several times now and are um, grateful to people like Philip and uh, Catherine Zuckert and uh, former Notre Dame graduate student uh, Raul Rodriguez, who, who've uh, had us here before and have um, allowed us to spend some time uh, working out our thoughts in company with you all, um, which has been really useful to us. Um, our last couple of appearances here were, were part of the development of the book that, um, that Philip mentioned, Why We Were Restless. And what we do in that book is examine um, the characteristic way in which modern human beings tend to pursue happiness. And we also examine the characteristic way in which modern pursuits of happiness tend to fail. Uh, and we do that with the help of some of the greatest minds in the French tradition of political philosophy. That is, Michel de Montaigne and, and Blaise Pascal and Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Alexis de Tocqueville. So at the end of that book, we suggest that liberal education, rightly understood, 
might have something to do with, uh, or might have something to, to offer, to, to ameliorate the um, restless condition of the modern soul. And to our surprise, we found that this part of the book was actually the thing that proved the most controversial with the very people with whom we thought it would be most congenial. That is, so we did this, we did this panel at a, uh, about the book at a national political science conference. And we were talking with some wonderful liberal educators about the book and, and some of them, including Catherine Zuckert herself, wondered aloud whether liberal education could actually be useful in dealing with the kinds of problems of modern unhappiness that we described. And that taught us that we needed to be clear about exactly what we meant by liberal education and exactly how we thought it could help. So the talk that we're going to give you all today is an effort at achieving some of that clarity. Um, its style is somewhat unusual for a university lecture. And in this, this matter of style, we're taking the advice of, of one of our mentors, uh, Mark Lilla, um, who, who recommends to, to his students who want to be writers, he tells them, you need to kick away the scaffold. And what he means by that is, is the following. That is, people with educations like ours, people with educations like I think a lot of the people in this room, people who've studied you know, the great books, often prefer to talk about those books and their authors as opposed to dealing with phenomena directly and talking about what they themselves have come to think about those phenomena. Oftentimes, people like us would rather tell you what Plato thinks than what they think. Um, and while we've learned a lot from those kinds of books and those kinds of authors, what we're going to do today is talk about what we saw in the classroom, what we thought was going on in the souls of our students. And we're going to talk about that in the first person. And so if you'd like to, now this, is, this has all been informed by, of course, the, the, the readings that we've done over the years and the kind of readings that I think people in this room have done. The, um, and if, you, if you'd like to hear about that, we're, we're ready to talk about it in the um, in the question session, but but this is going to be a um, largely a first person kind of talk. Go ahead. Thanks. So I'm going to begin by telling you um, about a class that we taught just before we left Furman University for the American Enterprise Institute, and that was a first year engaged living class. So students would apply to be in this program. They would live together, and they take a fall class with my husband and a spring class with myself. Um, because of this unusual arrangement, we were permitted to have TAs, teaching assistants, which don't usually exist at Furman. And so we had the chance to invite some senior students, people who had studied with us for four years, to come help us teach and to see what it means to teach, you know, through our perspective. And that was unexpectedly and really enriching for us because we had to articulate what we were trying to do in the classroom. And they asked us lots of questions about what we were doing and what we were seeing that caused us to look afresh at our activity. So one of the questions that most interested and perplexed them was how did we know which students were heading down the right path and which were on the wrong track? How did we figure out which instincts and habits to encourage and which to check? They noticed that our judgments weren't lining up with traditional markers of success. Students who are hitting all, all the marks, we seem to be inexplicably fretting over. These were the kind of students who sailed through the campus gates already festooned with honors. They were your valedictorians, your three-sport athletes, people who had invented things or started clubs to deal with problems we'd never even heard of before. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Their resumes were very, very thick. They were really impressive. And we loved these students. At first, we loved them in part because we thought, we don't really, they don't really need us, right? We can just sit here and revel in their accomplishments, kind of you know, help them along their, their merry way. Um, they seem to have everything figured out, right? They'd come to our offices um, in the first few weeks upon arriving at Furman, and they would unfurl these spreadsheets, <laughs> multicolored um, graphs of every class they planned to take over the course of their next four years at Furman. Their biggest and most burning question was usually something like, whether I should head straight to law school when I finish, or maybe I'll take a loftier route and first do a PhD. Law school, PhD, law school, PhD. We seem to be playing safely within the 40 yard lines. But then they'd come back 
in the fall of their senior year. And those colorful part charts would seem to be coming apart at the seams. Their faces looked tired, haggard, like they'd just been through a war rather than a series of stimulating courses on a leafy campus. The old question resurfaced, law school, PhD. But beneath it now churned in a sea of anxiety and confusion. They were actually no longer sure they had the energy for either. Maybe it would be best to get away, they'd say. Go somewhere, far away, maybe across the globe. Now, there exists a program, I need to warn you, that speaks directly to such students at this moment of crisis. It does have other more legitimate purposes, but it also serves to lure such students with the opportunity to escape it all while avoiding that dreaded gap on their resume. It's called the Fulbright program. <laughs> <laughs> and particularly those parts of that aspect of the Fulbright program, that program within the Fulbright program that sends you somewhere exotic to teach English is often an excuse to not make up your mind. So I would try to deflect them from that trap. But then they were flummoxed because there was no prestigious alternative that seemed you know, like an easy course for them. So I don't know, Dr. Story, they'd say, maybe I'll just go back home. I, I'll just, I'll open up a coffee shop. Now, when they said such things, you have to understand this was not the culmination of a four-year plan to go into small business, right? That, that's perfectly fine way of life. No, this was a way of going dark to themselves. So how did these very bright, intensely promising young people come to this pass? That's the question that animated the book that my husband and I just wrote, Why We Are Restless. We called it Why We Are Restless because what we saw in these students was, we thought, described by the word restless, in the sense that their lives were full of activity, but devoid of purposive, purposive action. They did lots of things. They were extremely busy. But at the end of the day, they were simply tired rather than fulfilled. They'd done it all just as they'd planned. But in the end, they weren't sure what exactly it was they had done. Now, we use the word restless in a Tocquevillian sense. If you're familiar with that, we can talk about it afterwards. The sense he uses it in his um, great book, Democracy in America. We'd say it's a typical kind of modern restlessness. And I want to distinguish it right now from another kind of restlessness that you may have encountered in your readings. The restlessness um, described by someone like Augustine. Um, Augustine famously said that his heart was restless until it found rest in God. Now, if you've read the Confessions, you know that he had a pretty long, messy, confused period of life um, that might look in some ways like the student I was describing. But there's a key difference, a decisive difference. At some point, Augustine became utterly determined, fanatically determined even, to find the truth about the best way of life. He tried out lots of extreme things in the process but he never let himself willingly go dark to himself. So I've talked about those students from our first year class who had all the outward signs of success, but yet had inward marks of future trouble. Our teaching assistants were equally surprised at our reaction to some of the, those not so apparently successful students. The students who are a little awkward, even slightly disruptive at times in class. They didn't always do the assignments exactly as directed either. What on earth did we see in these people, and why were we encouraging their clumsy efforts? Well, in some of them, we detected a kind of Augustinian quality. When we talked about this in reference to those students, we gave it a name, intellectual honesty. This became the habit that we were most intent on cultivating when we found the spark of it, because it was, we thought, the virtue that signaled the best, it was the best sign of future success. In other words, it was the best indicator that a student would find the four years he spent in college to be productive and helpful to his life, rather than provoking of confusion and restlessness. So what does intellectual honesty look like when you first see it? Students who have this quality are the kind that don't try to say things that they think we want to hear. So they would tell me when their thoughts and desires didn't match up with the argument that I was presenting from a given text. In our first year class, for example, we read Plato's Republic. And when I would be retelling the argument that Socrates makes to Glaucon about how the just life really would make you happy, these students would say things like, I get it, Dr. Story, but honestly, what I really want is a Bugatti. <laughs> <laughs> and they wouldn't stop there. They'd engage with my questions about it. The first time that was 
said to me, I had to say, what is a Bugatti? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously not in my realm of experience. But once they answered that, I said, okay, why precisely do you want that? What kind of happiness do you expect it would give you? These students were willing to talk to, about themselves and not in the faux re revelatory manner of Facebook or an application essay, but truly about their messy longings. They'd write papers that were risky, that took on questions like, I know Thomas Aquinas says that everyone seeks, seeks to attain the good, but what about my friend who tried to commit suicide? Or, I get bored easily. Should I try to avoid that or can boredom be good? Such questions don't lend themselves to easy answers. You take the risk of not meet, reading, excuse me, you take the risk of not reaching a meaningful conclusion. You're hardly certain of writing an A paper. Someone with intellectual honesty, in short, is the type who won't play the game when they're not sure why the game is being played. We saw in these students a glimmer of something that could be developed into the touchstone of a good life. But not everyone with the mark of budding intellectual honesty would succeed in developing it, of course. And not all of those who were succeeding by conventional measures were bound to lose their way. The good news is that intellectual honesty is something that can be learned. Indeed, it has to be developed to become a good guide for life. What was really disturbing us, though, was that spending four years in a liberal arts college wasn't reliably helping our most competent, successful students develop this virtue. And this was far from entirely their fault. After all, these were the students who had done everything the college asked them to do and excelled by every measure. That it was those students who were so, too often most directionless at the end signaled to us that how the college was teaching them to think about their lives and their choices was systematically wrongheaded. So just how are the young taught to chart the course of their lives? What tools do older generations provide them with for answering the question of how to live? Here, we wanna focus on two navigational devices to which the educational authorities of our time have most frequent re recourse. Those nav navigational devices are the checklist and the inner voice. Checklists minutely govern the academic life of the contemporary undergraduate. In my many years as an academic advisor, the first thing I would do upon meeting first year students newly arrived on campus was to give them a checklist that charted their path through the general education requirements. For those who went on to major in my, my discipline, uh, political science, I had another checklist. And those who cleared uh, the hurdles that it laid out earned the right to call themselves bachelors of arts in politics. So the checklist appeals to students because it's an orderly and rational way to chart one's progress. First year writing seminar, check. Intermediate Spanish, check. Politics 101, aha. That one I got before I even arrived on campus by taking AP government in high school and notching a five on the exam. And it satisfies both a GER and a major requirement. Double check. <laughs> so students like checklists because they're concrete documentation of their work and their progress. And that be maybe one reason double and triple majors have become so popular, right? Having more than one major allows one to organize almost all of one's education in checklist form. Now, in my own education, several electives, courses that do not fill a box on a checklist. For those of you who don't know, that's what an elective is. The, uh, <laughs> the, the, those courses proved to be decisive turning points. I just took a class because it looked interesting. And lo and behold, that's what I ended up doing with my life. Um, so, but when I suggest to students that they might take those kinds of courses just because they seem interesting, some find the, the, the some find the very thought of 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 taking a course that doesn't that doesn't fill any 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 box on a checklist. They find this kind of absurd, even even a little revolting. Like I I just suggested that they pass a Friday evening in a dive bar. Um, so some students like checklists so much that they don't see any reason to restrict them to academic life. They apply them to more personal matters too, like dating. So tall, check, <laughs> handsome, 
Check. Likely to make a good living. Check. Religious. Needs further investigation. <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> so here's the problem with education organized by checklists. The lists don't measure what they purport to measure. They're disconnected from their end. So what do these kinds of educational checklists claim to measure? Core or general education requirements claim to measure liberal education. And liberal education is a noble thing. But ask yourself, does doing the stuff it takes to fill those boxes, sitting through your classes, passing multiple choice exams, actually make you more like liberal education's greatest exemplars? More like Socrates or Martin Luther King Jr. There is, to be honest, no necessary connection between completing such requirements and developing the traits of mind and character that result from genuine liberal education. Indeed, there might be something of an inverse correlation because people such as Socrates and Martin Luther King Jr. are characterized precisely by the unwillingness to play games of which they do not see the point. So educational authorities know that the checklist is not enough. And so they supplement it with a second navigational device, and that's the inner voice. The inner voice is supposed to provide a warmer, more personal kind of guidance, more quirky than the checklist, more independent. So if you are at all like me, at some point in the course of your education, an authority has, while you're having a conversation about what you ought to do with your life, uh, thrown you back on yourself told you that only you can answer that question, that you need to, to follow, your, follow your own star, be true to your authentic self, express the real you. The cliches pile up like jackknife tractor trailers on I-90. <laughs> so this, this, this inner voice for which we have all these formulas, it, 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 it's supposed to appear as a kind of emotional divine command a deep and assured summons of the soul that draws us toward a life that suits us, like the muse evoked by the poets as the source of their songs. Educational authorities' references to it are meant, I think, to express their respect for human individuality, to indicate that they aren't trying to mold the young according to a predetermined formula. But again, in my own education, I, I made a disturbing discovery. When I did some of that inward listening that my, my mentors were, were talking about, I found that I couldn't hear the inner voice. I, I, was a, I was a confused and wayward young man, and I would have welcomed a divine command, speaking authoritatively from within me and telling me just what I ought to do with my life. But when I listened to what was going on inside, I found that I had longings and I had questions, but I did not have a command, this piece of essential equipment that was supposed to have been like installed at the factory just wasn't there in the model of the human person that I found myself inhabiting. So in conversation with students, I've discovered that some of them claim to have inner voices and that those inner voices tend to express themselves in surprisingly conventional ways. I've, I've wanted from birth to be an international human rights lawyer. <laughs> But others who are, who are more like me, they, they just don't hear it. And when they discover, they just don't experience a deep romantic summons to be a this or a that. And when they make this discovery, some of them decide to fake it. So they'll, they'll tell you, I, I have a deep and inexplicable attraction to venture capital. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but other students ask probing questions of their educations. These are, I think, some of the more intellectually honest students that my wife was describing. Just what, I, what might I find on this campus that will help me figure out how I should live? So the problem with education oriented by checklists and the inner voice is that these two devices keep reason and longing in separate compartments. So checklists make academic life look orderly and progressive but they have no uh, essential relation to the human aspiration for genuine excellence, much less happiness or integrity. As for the, uh, the inner voice, it's supposed to be an idiosyncratic oracle 
with which one cannot reason and whose commands are, are simply beyond question. So ideally, it might be the case that reason sort of creates a checklist to execute the inner voice's firm commands. But even in that case, the ultimate aims of our life would remain arbitrary. Is this really how it has to be? That the best life is a kind of slavery to one's own whims, and that reason is never more than a dull, if effective, servant of such arbitrary willfulness. So the combination of reason reduced to a desiccated box checker and longing understood as an inscrutable summons stands in the way of the kind of conversation in which liberal education should consist. Okay, I'm gonna pick up on that claim, which is that liberal education should provoke a conversation between your reason and your longings. So what do we mean by that? How is such a conversation possible and how can you begin to engage in it? I'm gonna make a few general points about your longings and your reason so you can understand why we think it's possible for the two to have not just a relation of convenience, but a true conversation. The first point is that it's possible for your longings to talk to your reason because your longings have reasons of their own. Longing, in other words, has an intellectual component or aspect. You want things that you find pleasurable or painful for a certain reason, even if that reason is at first opaque to you. Your inclinations are marked by intellect. The second point is that your reason can converse with your longing because your reason has longings of its own. Reason has a desiring quality. Your mind wants to see. Your intellect, in other words, is marked by inclination. And then the last point, the amazing thing you discover when you get your reason and your longing talking to each other is that you have a part of your soul that you may have never seen before. When we artificially separate reason from longing and longing from reason, we systematically overlook, we fail to see, fail to hear a precious capacity we have, a faculty that can be the guiding force of our efforts to choose well, to think well about how we will spend our lives. Some of you may have recognized the, the book I'm glossing here um, from, your, from your studies. I'm, I'm glossing Aristotle's ethics, and he, he calls this part of the soul desiring mind or minded desire. It's intellect tinged with longing or longing marked by thinking. And getting you to see this part of your soul, to discover what, whether it might really be there, is the point of our talk. So what I've just said is the theoretical nub of this argument. But practically speaking, how do you learn to see this part? One of the first strategies is to take your longing seriously. Get them to speak in terms that your reason can understand. So let me start with one of the most common longings that students have when they come to college. One of the things that often animates, animates you most basically, whatever it is you've written on your application statement. And that's the desire to be well off. In other words, the longing for money. Now, some of our students will be frank about this. After hearing some dean encouraging an incoming class to spend the next four years seeking the meaning of life, they'll say, to be honest, Dr. Story, I don't want meaning out of college. I want money. Have you heard that phrase before? It's, I hear it's becoming more, pop, more popular, right? I don't want meaning, I want money. It makes sense in a way for students to say this. It is an understandable mirroring of adult expectations and desires. After all, your college may or may not, deep down, want meaning out of you, but it definitely wants money. <laughs> there is no mistaking that. They will give you a bill at the end of the semester and pester you for the rest of your life <laughs> for more, right? Okay, so wanting money seems like a sensible longing, a solid desire, a hard-headed even, definitely rational. But is it? Let's get reason to converse with this longing. Will money make you happy? Yes, comes the answer from an unlikely source, Thomas Aquinas. Money will make you happy, but only in a certain way, he adds, and up to a certain point. Money can't itself be enjoyed, of course, but it is useful. It can be traded for things that we need and also things that we want. Food, clothing, shelter, Bugattis, lattes. <laughs> Money can't be enjoyed directly, but in the way that all those different things can. But to be honest, it's often necessary to acquire those things. Now, says my student, I get what you're saying. 
but I would enjoy having a lot of money. It would give me pleasure to have a full bank account. Okay, let's continue the conversation with reason and longing. What is the precise pleasure of having a full bank account? First of all, there's a comfort in knowing that if your old car breaks down, you can buy a new one. If your mom gets sick, you can help her out with her bills. And if nothing of those bad things happen, well, you can buy the next iPhone or a new pocketbook or next year's video game. You can go to Paris. You can go to Notre Dame. The precise pleasure of a full bank account is that the money in there can turn into anything. But that means, rationally speaking, money is not a solid good. It is a liquid good. It is flexible protein. It's a shapeshifter. That's actually why we like it. Some people say money is power, but to be more accurate about it, it's possibility. That means that money is logically, rationally, unable to be an end in itself. It can't make you happy. Now, it is a means to many things that might make you happy. But how would you know? The plain truth is that students who say, I don't want meaning, I want money, can't avoid facing the question of meaning someday because they're gonna to have to answer that question, what will I trade my money in for? But what if you let your reason relax halfway through this conversation with longing? If you try to let yourself take money as an end, if you let money become the orienting point of your life, if you implicitly take money as your highest good, the furthest horizon you can see, if you delight above all in the possibilities that money opens up, up and the student pushed us there to think about this. After we talked about it as a class for a while, we said, okay, possibility is wonderful. It allows you to do many things. It excludes only one thing, actuality. Those good things you can enjoy, enjoy only when you give up other things, like a marriage. Right? Marriage is something you have to commit to and to enjoy its good. Also, a, a job, an expertise. Right? You can't be all of these things at once. Probably most of you know someone who's become addicted to possibility. So preoccupied, for example, with making money and the doors it can open, that they cease to see the actualities before them. Usually their life starts to go a little gray. They become more concerned, for example, with providing for a family than actually spending time with the people who make it up. They seem to be more enthused to be with people who might help them make a deal or introduce them to a new opportunity. That's what the story of King Midas was written to illustrate. Midas was so talented, so lucky, that everything he touched turned to gold, including his daughter. If you don't take your very understandable longing for money seriously, if you don't get that longing into a serious conversation with reason, but rather assume that that longing is rational, your longings will unwittingly lead you to a place like that. But what about when the reverse happens? Those times when you don't let your longings rule, when you start to want something, but then your reason steps in quickly to shut it down. Let me take this example. You're an accomplished young woman. You've made excellent grades and it's the spring of your senior year. You're sitting in the coffee shop working on one of your very last assignments, when your eye catches a really cute guy sitting on the other side of the cafe. He's talking to some friends. After a while, you get up to order another coffee and amazingly, he gets into line right behind you. He starts up a conversation. It's just small talk, but you find out that he knows one of your friends. You order your coffee, you move to the end of the bar, and you can't help hearing his voice, tuning into his voice as he chats with the woman at the counter. You start to wonder whether you should ask that mutual friend for a bit more information. But wait, shouts your reason. Don't be stupid. You have a great job waiting for you and it's halfway across the country. Why would you get tangled up with someone right now? What would Aquinas say? I think he would say, don't lecture your longings, converse with them. What precisely is it that attracted you to this guy? Now we know from years of teaching that students tend not to believe in love at first sight, but Shakespeare did and Plato and the writers of the gospels and, and they're pretty smart. So let's ask, what is it that attracted you to this guy? Was it the way he combed his hair? Was it that he combed his hair? <laughs> <laughs> Was it the way he talked to the woman behind the counter or to his friends? Might you want to be talked to like that perhaps for the rest of your life? Maybe that's more important to your happiness than that job you thought you always wanted. But how would you know? 
The only way to tell which of your longings are rational is to take those longings seriously and ask them questions. Start a conversation between reason and longing in which each has a part. If you do that, you'll find that, as Pascal says, the heart has reasons which reason doesn't know, but can come to know and be enriched by. For it's the case that sometimes your longings see first and sometimes your reason does. One neat effect of the conversation between reason and longing is that it will make your reason more rational. It will no longer be content with cheap checklists or easy answers like money. It will no longer allow itself to be confined to a cynical side remark. It won't just be a school marm, a naysayer, some kind of alien power that sits in your soul preventing you from doing anything too dumb. It will actually become the guiding light in a truly searching quest for what will truly satisfy. And your longings will also become deeper and stronger, more themselves. When longing is really allowed to speak, to grow up and become articulate, it won't be content with just letting loose on the weekends. It will want to be part of your life all the time. And it won't express itself as a whimsical command of an idiosyncratic oracle. Instead, it will urge you on a new quest, press you to undertake some surprising explorations to discover where it is your heart leads. When we get reason and longing to converse, we start to hear that new part of our soul, that part I called earlier desiring mind or minded desire. It is, Aristotle says, a very important part. It's in fact the part that he says leads the way or chooses. It's the part that makes you are. It's the part that defines what it is to be human. As he puts it, to be human is to be a starting point of this sort, whose actions are propelled and structured by this intertwinement of reason and desire. Locating this part of your soul helps you to discover and develop the virtue and habit of intellectual honesty that I spoke of at the beginning of the lecture. For intellectual honesty comes from a kind of integrity the integration of or honest conversation with your reason and your longings. It's key to the refusal to let yourself, it's key to the refusal to let yourself go dark to yourself. So my wife has, has uh, uh, described in some detail the conversation between reason and longing, but this might all seem to be just too much about you, too much about the self. What about doing good for other people? What about all the injustice in the world? Am I not obliged to make my primary aim in education not asking self-centered questions, but working actively in a rough world to help people and advance justice? Concerns like that are common on college campuses and they're common for a good reason. Justice is a fundamental political concern as well as a profound personal aspiration. It is rightly at the center of our public debates and is an object of earnest striving for serious people in many religious and philosophic traditions. But even the most noble longings, if not brought into conversation with reason in the way that my wife described, if not deepened and made more intelligent by the kind of questioning at the heart of liberal education can lead us astray. Let me try to explain what I mean uh, when I suggest that even noble longings left unexamined can lead us astray by, by giving you a kind of hypothetical story, a story of some, some common undergraduate passions played out over the course of an adult life. So let's say that you're an intelligent, driven young person who wants to advance justice in the world. So you spend your time in college and then in professional school getting the credentials you need to do the work that you imagine will most help you advance your goals of social responsibility. And then you land a coveted professional perch from which you have a real opportunity to, as we say, make an impact. You're succeeding at your aims and you start to gain recognition for your work. People appreciate your vibrancy and your concern for the causes that they also care about. They, they seek you out, they wanna to talk to you, they ask for your advice. And along the way, you get married. You start a family and you find a home in proximity to your parents. But you never started that conversation between your reason and your longings. And that's because they're noble longings. And people readily approve them as such. If you tell people, I want to work for justice, oftentimes they say, good for you. So they seem to be good enough guides on their own. Here's the problem. 
You want to work for justice, but you've never taken the time seriously to ask yourself, just what is this justice in which I'm so interested? Taking justice seriously, excuse me, taking justice seriously is not as simple as dedicating your energies to headline grabbing causes. Taking justice seriously means actually understanding how to benefit other human beings to concretely improve their lives. And to do that, one has to understand what is actually good for human beings. And that is not at all obvious. So failing to ask questions like, what is justice? And what truly makes a human life better? You will be putting your desire to help others, uh, excuse me, you'll be pursuing your desire to help others in a way that is essentially random or reactive. The well-intentioned advice you give to people may be seriously misguided and it might lead them astray. The projects you develop, the programs you start, may turn out to damage the lives of others. You may trample on people who stand in the way of your ideological commitments. Your family life, too, is vulnerable to conflict because you let ideological concerns and political opportunities take priority over more intimate obligations. The vibrancy that once marked your outward demeanor and made your passion so compelling to other people might become tainted with uncertainty and cynicism and bitterness. And then one day, you might just get sick of inhabiting the identity that you so energetically crafted for yourself. You might surprise everyone you know by suddenly quitting your job. And that, that, that unique perch from which you could advance your vision of justice. You might just decide to trade in that post for say a job at a profit-driven international corporation that will allow you and that will allow all your hard work to pay off in the form of an ample salary and some cushy perks. Without ever really knowing it, you may adopt the very kind of life that you always thought of as crassly self-serving. Now, why would you do that? That is one of the unintended consequences that's possible when you let yourself go dark to yourself. This is one of the unintended consequences consequences of, of becoming so busy fighting the good fight that you fail to question your more personal longings. That is, you fail to examine your own quest for happiness. The desire for happiness, as Aristotle tells us, is a desire that just can't be avoided. It's universal among human beings, even those who strive to live without concern for self. It will be there, waiting, even as you spin around serving noble causes. Your most basic longing that's left unexamined and unrefined will get stronger, but not better, and eventually may express itself as the plain old love of money. If you keep mind and desire separate, someday you may end up back at the beginning at Moral Philosophy 101. When we fail to bring reason and longing into conversation with one another, when we do not use the opportunity of liberal education to rationally refine the aim of our longings and give our desire for understanding the time and the resources it needs to advance, we may seek to help others, but we won't actually know how. Meanwhile, we will be pursuing happiness because all human beings necessarily do that, but that pursuit will become disjointed, grasping, and restless. So, how exactly can a liberal education help you become more thoughtful and less restless? How can a liberal education do what it was meant to do, help you become a person capable of being truly free, exercising your freedom in self-government and governing with others? Following your college's general education requirement checklist won't lead you there, nor will consulting your inner voice. You need to find your own way through whatever requirements and elective possibilities that your college sets out for you in a manner that prompts your reason and desire to engage in a deeper conversation. So we're gonna conclude with two practical suggestions for how to do this. These are things you can do yourself regardless of what college you're in or if you're in college at all. The first strategy is to ask yourself, what is it that you really want to know with your life? Because reason has a motive force of its own. It wants, it longs to know. 
The intellect itself has an appetite that needs to be satisfied by knowledge. The mind is an intrinsic part of your desiring and striving self. Now, maybe when I pose that question, what is it that you want to know with your life? An answer immediately popped into your head. <laughs> or maybe not. If not, ask yourself, well, what have I heard that sticks with me? Something my grandma said, or my coach, or my professor? A friend. If a student asks me to help him become clearer about his own question, I often ask to see a book that we're reading together, or a book he finds important, and see what passages he's marked up or put double stars next to. And just say, why did you think that was important? Why did that stick out to you? The fact is that every one of your inclinations is marked with intellect in some way. And so if you trace the dots of those things that seem to matter to you, even if you don't know why, you may come up with your life's question. And then you can make choices by its light. What classes, internships, activities, relationships even, will help you figure out what it is you want above all to know? By identifying your life's question, your path will become clearer and more definite. But why a question? A question, our great teacher Leon Cass liked to say, is a form of desire. Quite literally, question gives, a question gives form to desire. It takes your inchoate longings, your anxieties, curiosities, confusion, and gives them a shape. It launches you in a certain direction, on an investigation. Now, it's possible to make a question a key feature of an entire academic program. Uh, Dr. Cass was involved with the establishment of such a program that we were involved with at the University of Chicago. It's called Fundamentals, Issues and Text. It's an undergraduate program. And when students apply to that, they are asked to submit what we call a question statement. In other words, a page or two that lays out a question that they want to follow for the next three years of study. Those students would ask questions that you might be familiar with from say, Plato's Republic, like, what is justice? But they'd also ask questions like, what does it mean to be a good mother? Or, why is wandering pleasant? And then they'd choose a few books to study, authors who they thought would speak wisely to those questions. They listen to those books and learn from, their, from them, and every year rewrite their question statements. This helps make, make the trajectory of their desiring minds clearer and more precise. So maybe you're in such a program, and if so, that's great. But if not, you can do this for yourselves and ask a friend or a professor to read it over and help you with it. The second strategy we'll recommend is to ask, who is it you long to become with your life? What qualities of character are most important for you to cultivate? So that's different than the question, than the one you, you hear most often, which is, what do you want to do when you grow up, right? which typically tends to arouse anxiety or a cookie cutter answer, one that will get the questioner off your back, right? Don't say librarian, <laughs> say investment banker, and everyone will just leave you alone. <laughs> or better, just don't answer at all and ask yourself, what kind of a person do I want to become? I wanna close with an illustration of uh, a story of a student who asked this question and uh, changed the trajectory of, life, of his life because of it. Now, this student was a conventionally very successful student. He was the type that came in uh, doing very well and with lots of plans for his future. But this one, uh, sometime around the middle of his sophomore year, started to think that he might be on the wrong track. Now, to all outward appearances, he was on the right track, indeed the fast track to a good career. He had already interned in, uh, in finance and in defense consulting. Um, but something in his experiences at those prestigious firms made him unsure. And so he came to me for advice. And I asked him that question. What kind of a person do you want to become? After he thought for a while, he said, I want to be a responsible person. And I said, why? He said, well, my, my dad died when I was very young. And for a while, there was no one who could take his place to take up his responsibilities and be responsible for me and my younger brother. After a while, I found a coach who was very helpful and then a professor. There were people in my life that became fathers and I'm grateful to them but I'm not sure I can live up to their example. Okay, so why are you thinking about a career in finance? I asked. It became clear to him that he was drawn to this because those people seemed like they could take a lot on. They seemed like responsible people. But then he wasn't sure that they were responsible in the way he wanted to be. So this is an example, a good example, I think, of a successful young person who let his reasons and longings talk to each other. He refused to let himself go dark to himself in the pursuit of a seemingly bright future. 
Instead, he found that spark of intellectual honesty inside of him. He changed his mind and he changed the course of his life. He looked with new eyes on his studies and other opportunities. Before long, he found a young woman committed to her in marriage, committed to her church. And now they think with remarkable responsibility about how to raise their future family. We saw them last weekend and they're expecting their first baby in October and they're 22 or 23. He has a good job, a job in journalism. He's making steady progress in writing thoughtful, responsible, truly useful things. And that's hard to do in the journalistic world today. It's an amazing thing that in our country, we afford approximately half of our young people the opportunity to take four years to prepare for adult life. You can use this precious time to identify your questions, read wise books, talk to faculty and friends about your longings, and make yourself less restless by starting out, on a, starting out your life on a pointed quest. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. That was wonderful. Uh, we have a tradition here in the program of uh, inviting our students to ask the first questions. Elizabeth, I'm going to ask you to run around with the microphone. Um, we can hear you in here, but we want to be able to get your question on the recording and identify yourself, your name, and where you are. So, any John? John, John wants to stand Hi, my name is John Babo. I'm a senior in the liberal arts program here at PLS, or the preeminent one. <laughs> Um, and a member of the Tocqueville program, loved the speech, that was awesome. If having a telos or a harbor that you are oriented towards and you know putting all your experiences towards that goal is so important to living a happy, fulfilling life, you know, why then have a liberal regime which <laughs> doesn't believe in orienting its citizens towards one substantive notion of the common good? Why not go back to this a more ancient understanding of the city that actively orients their population and inculcates them with virtues? I think uh, that's a great question. And I, I think the answer depends on the meaning of the word have. In other words, you said, why, if, if having such a telos is the crucial thing to getting a life oriented properly, well, what does it take to have such a telos? Uh, I don't think that just being told what the telos is is actually adequate to having it. Here, I want to um, think about one of the one of the uh, thinkers that we wrote about in Why We Rest, is Blaise Pascal. Pascal is one of the greatest religious apologists of the modern world. He's he's really terrific at explaining Christianity to modern pagans, which is the way that he thinks about what he's trying to do in his work. But he doesn't actually think that he can make you believe. He thinks that what he can do is be a street sweeper for grace. That is, he can, he can get stuff that's confusing out of the way so that you might be able to begin on a quest for the hidden God on your own. But the culmination of that quest is not something that is within human power to realize. And so, you know, I think, um, I don't think that the, the idea of just telling people what the end is really understands what it means to have an end, which is that you've, you've possessed it for yourself. And that possession can only begin with a, um, an energetic course of seeking. I'm just gonna add one thing to this. Um, one way to understand liberalism uh, is to understand it as a system that's designed for people who are sorted into groups with very strong teloi, right? So that mm -hmm. you can be in, um, you can be members of different churches, members of different communities that do raise their children in a particular indeterminate way. And the overarching liberal order is there to help those groups get along and mutually aid each other in those things in which uh, they can. They can. Um, I think that understanding of liberalism works best when people do have formed their lives and communities around a strong sense of what is good, right? Because then you have something you cherish, your way of life and, and your way of life that you live in communion with others that you want to protect and you're willing to like kind of bring to the, t the table and negotiate with, right? Like, I'll let you do this over there if you let me do this over here, basically. I think some of the reason that um, liberalism is seeming a lot less attractive and less workable to people is that they don't have those strong communities um, that are in, in some 
understanding of, of liberalism anyway, the, the basis of, of the system, a complicated sort of paradoxical system. Thank you. Another student question, uh, Catalina. Hi, I'm Catalina, I'm a sophomore here. Um, so first of all, I really appreciated your talk. I really liked this idea of the minded desire and of being like an integrated human being, having an integral education. Um, I think that like my generation or as time goes on, I see like some like deep distractions of social media, of technology, of all these tools of modernity as really like a disintegrating force stopping us from pursuing what what you've laid out in your talk. So I was just wondering what what do you think about that with like the um my generation now? How are we distracted? How can we still use and live in the modern world um without like giving in to just living mindlessly, thoughtlessly? Hmm. I think I think we might begin to think about the answer to your question by but remembering that um, the taste for distraction is much, much older than the internet, than modern democracy itself. That is, um, you know, in, in the 17th century, um, Blaise Pascal described the taste for human diversion and asked, like, what, you know, what, is, what does being diverted mean? Being diverted means being turned away. That's what, that's what we've you know, when we, you know, like when you, when you sort of mindlessly pick up your phone and start scrolling through stuff, like why, what are you doing? Oftentimes you're not actually looking to find something. You're looking to escape something. What's the something you're looking to escape? What Pascal thinks we're looking to escape, he describes and he says like what we find when we sit alone in a room with ourselves in silence. And that's certain very basic facts about the human condition, that we want knowledge, but we're doomed to be ignorant. We want life, we're doomed to die. We want happiness, and we're gonna suffer. All these things are just true and unavoidably true about ourselves, but we don't wanna face them. And so we just uh, look for anything that gets our minds off of ourselves. And a modern, commercial democracy and like one of the wonderful things about it is that it makes us like much more comfortable and prosperous and so on and so forth than most people in most times and places have had the good luck to be. But that means that their <laughs> distractions are incredibly abundant, all right? You can find them anywhere. It's really easy the, um, to do that sort of wandering away from oneself that, that Pascal thinks is a really natural human tendency. I think it's Useful to remember a, a remark of um, this, this um, philosopher who's written, a, he, he did this book that is like an edition of Pascal and a commentary on it at the same time, Peter Kraft at, at, um, at Boston College. Um, and uh, he says, if you, you, we're, we're terrified of spending time alone with ourselves in silence. Like, I feel like we can't like do a minute of that. But he testifies from his own experience with this, if you actually try it, it's a profoundly liberating thing to do. So perhaps that might be somewhat helpful in dealing with distraction. Yeah, I think, I think you have to actively seek to uh, combat the, your, your tendency to distraction, which as my husband says, is a human tendency. It's not just a contemporary tendency, although it's exacerbated in some ways by the technologies you talk about. Um, and that's one good technique. I was reminded when you were speaking of um, someone we met, a professor that we met at Villanova when we were giving a talk about our book there. And she came up to us afterward and said, after I read your book, I installed this like Pascal portal on my iPhone. <laughs> and every time I want to go to, I don't know, social media or anything, that any kind of app or whatever that would distract her, she had to like click on the the face of Pascal. <laughs> I never thought that this was, this was crazy, but so brilliant in a way. Um, you know, just, you, you, I mean, a lot of this is technique, right? Because technique forms your habits, right? And, and, and your habits actually form your desires. So you can, uh, in, in our talk, we try not to just reason about things, you know, and tell you like, well, if you come to a better understanding, then your, your life will conform. That's mm -hmm. not, these things kind of work with each other. You actually have to work on your desires 
as well. Um, and particularly for something like social media, uh, social, right? You, you, it's hard to do, a, it's hard to reform social media use on yourself, uh, with yourself alone, mm -hmm. right? You have mm -hmm. to work on that with a group of friends, ideally, right? So find other ways to contact each other, other ways to update each other. And you can live a, a very meaningful social life without social media, actually. People have been done it for a long time. Yeah, but it's hard for, it's hard to realize. Maybe you have realized that now. Um, oh, good, good. Question for a friend. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. I mean, actually, then you can, you can tell other people this because many young people don't, can't imagine having friends without some of the ways that we tend to connect nowadays. But it's possible, as you know, so great. More questions, yeah. Father Miss Campbell, please. Thanks so much for your talk. So we're here at Notre Dame, an explicitly Catholic university, and we hope to provide for our students, at least at our best, some sort of Catholic worldview, some way of leaning into life that's influenced uh, at its essence by the gospel by Jesus Christ, it's the young man, rich young man, coming and asking the Lord, what must I do to obtain eternal life, etc." So we want to give folks a view, not only of how they navigate their way on earth, but ultimately how they uh, uh, saved and gain entry into heaven. So how does religious faith and commitments fit in to what you've described here of, you know, this mm -hmm. tension between uh, longing and reason? Hmm. I think, or do you want you know, I, I have a beginning of an answer, but I'll start to give and you can. Okay, I will try to finish. Questions. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a good question. So we taught, it for, we've really spent our entire teaching careers not in Catholic universities. So at, for, at University of Chicago as graduate students and then at Furman. So starting from that point was not really an option for us. We also wanted our book to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they yeah so in the early 90s, uh, so yes, they were they were um, founded by the Southern Baptist Convention and tied with them for a long time. But in the early 90s, long before we got there, they, they had cut those ties. So many of our students were religious, but from different backgrounds, and some weren't. Uh, moreover, we wanted the book to uh, speak to people just in the, without necessarily any prior commitments to, to religious perspective. And so we begin the book with Montaigne, we try to speak to something that we think is common, more a more common denominator for most modern peoples. Um, but we try to show the attractiveness of Montaigne and then his limitations by having Pascal come in next and question him. Um, so that, that's one answer. But the other, the talk we gave today was more focused or grounded in Aristotle. And um, I think uh, this which was obviously not Catholic, right? But I did have the experience of a student working through Aristotle in the way that I'm more or less describing in this talk. And um, he already, you know, had was had some Christian ideas, at least, anyway. I wasn't sure what he thought about this. But um, Aristotle's understanding of the divine and of the relationship, as he put it, that the human being should have to the divine actually brought him to, you know, that this, this process of thinking through what Aristotle says about living a life that we're calling it intellectual honesty, of understanding the erotic qualities of your reason and uh, the reasoned qualities of your longing actually did lead him in that, in that direction. We got a, um, we had a fantastic student when we were at Furman. Um, she was the, uh, literally the top student in her class from a wonderful Catholic family. Um, she's, she's gone on to graduate school. You know, she, she applied here and you guys rejected her. <laughs> she got the top package from Yale. <laughs> it's with you people. The, uh, but she's... <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> the, uh, um, when we encountered her, in her first year of um, college, she'd had a, an education at a, um, what most would think of as a, as a solid kind of prestigious uh, Catholic high school. And we were talking about some question of how to live, or rather I can't remember exactly what facet of it was. And she said, well, 
I guess I could, you know, look at the Baltimore Catechism, which was just a dead thing. And that's the way she had experienced it in her own education. And I don't, I think you know, and, and I think, but I think this was, I'm a convert, and this was news to me as I, as I came into the church, that I, I think what was reanimating for this young woman about her liberal education is it allowed her to discover again religious life as an ongoing quest, as something that has its own kind of internal motion, as something with which one is never finished. One is, one is constantly converting more deeply. I think this is, this, is fairly, this is fairly common language, but I think, it, I think when we understand when we understand religious life simply as an answer or a comfort, that, that's, I, I don't think people who actually cross the border and get in there, that's not exactly what they often find. I mean, I, you know, I think I thought of religious life as, a, as kind of a comfort before I actually became religious. <laughs> and, and then I noticed that the most Christian people I know were the ones who were like, oh, there's a cross to be born, I will take that. Which is, which is a radically different understanding of, of, of life than, 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 I had, I had exp that, than I had thought I was going to get when I started knocking on this door. Okay, a few more questions. So, well, Professor O'Connor and then Sam Piccolo and then Luke and we just, we, and by uh, 1.45. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm Dave O'Connor. I'm in the philosophy department here. Uh, I think of myself as a luxury good. Uh, <laughs> and uh, though uh, there, there are so many things you said that I, uh, that I learned from that I agree with, and I can see where it comes out of your teaching. There, there's one thing that I want to push back on. Yeah. I think you're you're still making college too instrumental. Uh -huh. I want to tell students, I tell them all the time, you only get to go to college once. And I think the four years there with Notre Dame, at least if some of those years are with me, <laughs> it's self-justifying. Uh -huh. And I, I want to push against even the most high-minded way of leaving students in an instrumental understanding of those four years. Mm -hmm. So for, for me as a teacher, I feel like every day has to justify itself with me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the forward push that your description gives mm -hmm. uh, is something that I think uh, I resist something in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I just I'd mm -hmm. leave it at that for you to. Oh, yeah, let, uh, I think I can I can start on this, which is I think we're beginning from a sense that, particularly in the last five years or so that we were at Furman, we were encountering students in a deeper situation of moral confusion than in the earlier parts of our careers. We were encountering people who really could not tell up from down in the moral universe. They were just figuring out how and why to get out of bed in the morning had become a just much more widespread problem than we saw previously. And so we begin from the practical questions of moral philosophy. And we want to emphasize the, um, the sense that we can actually figure some stuff out about the question of how to live. Now, you're right that that question taken in a certain way can become a kind of instrumental question, right? I'm engaging in the inquiry so as to figure out how to live. But I think what you're describing as going on in your classes is, I think, I think we see this happen all the time in the course of undertaking 
these kinds of investigations, which is that you discover a new good. You discover a thing you didn't know was good. Discover, discover a thing that you didn't know was, was, was an experience that you wanted more of, which is the experience of seeking understanding. So if you look at you know, Thomas Aquinas's catalog of the various kinds of things human beings pursue, everybody understands why people are interested in money or pleasure, why you might be interested in something he calls goods of the soul. Well, that doesn't make any sense when you get started. So I'm, I'm very happy that you, 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 want, you want your day in the classroom to be self-justifying, the students to just to experience it as good. And that's what's good about college. And that's, that's largely the way that I experience college. But I think it is also the case that um, speaking to the profound and frankly dangerous longing for an answer to the question of how to live that is that is has become i think very urgent because we i think we live in a time of unusual moral confusion i i don't think we should shy away too much from speaking to that question and suggesting that you know what there's some things like my wife's meditation on on the exact value of money that that can be actually useful to us in a practical way and help, him, help you concentrate on the kind of intellectual exploration you're, you're speaking of. So we're going to try to get two more. Yeah, do you want to get them both yeah, so. uh, in and then we'll respond well, let, to both? Let's and then we'll help. Okay. I just wanted to ask if you see there being a relation between your thesis and that of someone like Matthew Crawford, who's focused more on a sort of practical reorientation of education around the skills in specific guilds, um, whether your thesis is directed solely towards a kind of uh, liberal arts education for a small sector of the population, or if there's something in it that can reorient education more generally. There probably is some overlap because we were chums in graduate school. So, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, but um, you want to? No, I think we're we're both concerned with uh, the problem of passivity, as we call it when we when we talk about it, um, uh, which is you know, um, Matt is more directly concerned with people not being able to take, kind of take charge of their own things around them, take charge of their own lives, take charge. Now he's writing about the political situation. Um, and I think this passivity we're approaching from, we're, we're thinking of the same thing, but we're approaching it from a bit of a, a different angle, which is the student who's falling apart because she doesn't know how to think about what to do. But, I think I'll just add that uh, we don't think liberal education is um, it should be uh, equated with college. Um, I, I think um, actually my 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 daughter is with us on this trip and she's visiting Notre Dame while we're here. She's getting a really fine liberal education in her high school, ma'am. And I would certainly love to see many more Americans benefit from that. You know, people who aren't necessarily going to go to college. Luke, I'm going to ask you to defer because I know we'll have you'll have time with the stories later. And ma'am, did you want to get a quick question? Yeah. Uh, Wiebke Marie Stock, I work at the Medieval Institute. My discipline is philosophy, and I teach a course on therapy of the soul right now. We read ah. part of your book. So uh, we had a very interesting discussion about that, and my question stems a little bit from that. Um, so the recommendations at the end uh, were about what an individual could do. But your starting point with the checklists showed it's also the institution. So how should... Or education be organized in a different way to allow for that discussion to happen because it's huge a huge part of it is time you need time to have these discussions and mm. if you have to cross all those items on your checklist yeah. you don't have that time or as one of my students said well these discussions should have started in elementary school um, so in a way you need to start thinking about these things early and if you're send from one assignment to the next and if you have one extracurricular activity after the other you never learn to take that time and make it productive mm. meaning that afternoon as a child you're bored and you have to figure out yourself what you could do with your time is essential and i have the impression from watching lots of children that they don't get that time and they also don't get it in college necessarily because they have to do too many things so what should be different in education to allow more for those electives, those interesting courses mm -hmm. you might take uh, without thinking about that? And my impression is that college in the United States is far too organized in that way, that there are far too many requirements that restrict what you do. Mm. That's really good. 
Um, <laughs> you know, shut down student life, yeah. <laughs> right? You know, it is too much activity. Yeah, you know, I'm just reminded uh, of um, in, in re, re, your your comment about boredom. You know, there's this um, awful but very interesting French novelist called Michel Houellebecq, who some of you may have encountered, and um, he's just got a really sharp remark on how writing happens. He says, you sit there and you get a little bit bored and it comes. And I think for many of us, we just never sit there and get a little bit bored and so nothing comes. <laughs> the, uh, that's a, and so your endorsement of boredom, I think, is, is right. As to, the, as to the institutional structures, you know, I was at a, um, another college last week a place lower down the, the, frankly, institutional pecking order, the Notre Dame. And I wonder if they might actually have more room for this because the competition there is not so fierce. And I saw a sign of it, this amazing thing. After my talk, a kid came up to me and invited me to a symposium that he and his friends had organized on a Friday evening. And I showed up to this symposium and there they all were, smoking cigarettes <laughs> and drinking gin and tonic. And, and then they invited their favorite professor to give them a lecture. And he gave this absolutely powerhouse lecture about, about the darkness of things and the light of things and it was poetry and, and the Bible and philosophy and it, it was just great. This is what they wanted to do with themselves on a Friday night. And um, I, I, I don't know what, uh, how a place like Notre Dame can relax the strings. And, but it's, I think you're right, that that's part of what they ought to be thinking about. It sounded like you had a great experience at Princeton, but we're glad you could. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, please join me in thanking Ben and Jenna. Okay. Thank you. 
Great stitch. I'm <laughs> 